A lot of conservation outreach focuses on animals, and there's a good reason for that. Animals are at worst gross and icky, and at best adorable and interesting. We can watch them move, react, and wonder about the logistics of owning a meerkat as a pet. But unfortunately for you, I read somewhere that when it comes to podcast listeners, it's treating mean and keeping keen, so sod that and let's talk botany. No, don't go. As incentive, I promise that before this episode is over, I'll discuss a fascinated endangered bat species. Still here? Great. So I'd like you to wind back the clock with me to around 800 years ago. New Zealand is swathed in forest, huge moa roam freely, and if you shake a tree, three or four kakapo will fall out. It's a bizarre and nonsensical land, but we're going to brush past that tree canopy, scale down the branches and touch down onto the floor. It's February, pleasantly warm and dry, and when we look down onto the forest floor, we can see small, white, bowl-shaped flowers poking out from the ground around tree roots. Dactylanthus taylori, New Zealand's only fully parasitic plant. Before the flowering season, this forest fruit doesn't look that impressive. It's a round, warty tuber, typically 40 centimetres in diameter, or about the size of a large beach ball. It attaches itself to the root of a host tree, and as it can't photosynthesize, it draws all nutrients through that connection. At this time in New Zealand history, Dactylanthus can be found in both the North and South Island, and the colonising Māori are beginning to use them as a sweetener, in even a dye. As the years tick on, small tribal myths grow around them, and they are given two names, Puarenga, or Flower of the Underworld, and Wai Wai Atua, meaning Fingers of the Atua, or God. At the point of infection, the host tree will warp around the Dactylanthus stem, forming a finely grooved disc. European settlers named the plant Wood Rose, and to this day, this part of the plant is collected for this mysterious shape. Wood roses are considered to be dioecious, that is, the male and female parts of the plant are not held in the same individual. In fact, in some places, there has been noted a hugely staggered male to female ratio of up to 20 to 1. There's some evidence showing that newly established plants produce predominantly female flowers, a fascinating population control measure that has evolved over the millennia. The complete flower head of a plant, including all flowers and stems, is called the inflorescence, and the tiny white flowers cluster into inflorescences that sprout from the tuber and contain either male or female flowers on several two centimetre long stalks, known as spadices. Of course, the goal of any flower is to be pollinated, and the dactylanthus emits a very strong musky smell. This is what has, up until a hundred years ago, attracted its main pollinator. Yep, as promised, it's cute fluffy batter clock. The short-tailed bat fed on the nectar held within the white flowers and spread pollen to different plants. A perfect little system, which unfortunately proved too good to last. The downfall of these two species have one thing in common, the Australian possum. Introduced in 1837 to establish a fur trade, these furry little bastards are common in New Zealand and notorious. From ripping bark off endemic trees to eating the local wildlife, possums are like... like Justin Bieber. Sure, they looked cute and harmless at first, but it turns out they have absolutely no redeeming qualities and are a blight on the country they inhabit. Possums are also attracted by the scent of nectar, and strip off all inflorescences in the bud stage. Considering that each plant is capable of producing over 50 inflorescences per season, and each inflorescence can produce 3,600 seeds, this is a hefty loss. Due to these large numbers, Dactylanthus has been able to evolve a long maturity time for the seeds, which can remain on the plant for up to four years. Possums are the main factor in the decimation of Dactylanthus populations, which currently stand at less than 5% of what it was before Europeans arrived on our shores. Possums have also harmed the short-tailed bat's habitat, teaming up with the vociferous hunter, the stoat, to shrink down the distribution of bat across New Zealand. They are so much of a pest that they actually end up making rats look like the good guys. In the absence of the short-tailed bat, rats have partially replaced them as pollinators, giving Doc a whole new problem to manage. If we eradicate all pests, could the few wood roses left even manage to pollinate? In the late 90s, people became more seriously aware of Dactylanthus's decline, and Doc was presented with a new set of problems. How do you protect a delicious smelling plant that lives right out in the open? And should we even try? 
That last sentence could seem a little dark or cynical, but bear with me. In a world of limited resources, people have to ask this question. Are there better species we should pour them into? And who really cares much about forest shrubs anyway? Probably not the general public beyond a cute piece of bric-a-brac to put on your mantelpiece. It's easy to dismiss plants as boring. I feel the instinct myself. I'd much rather get up close to a koala than a rare palm tree, but thinking this way can cut us off from a lot of fascinating problems to think our way around. In 2004, Doc released an action plan to assist with the dactylanthus decline, and it's a very interesting document. There's a huge stress on public awareness. It confidently puts forth that a new group, Friends of Dactylanthus, will reach out to businesses to adopt the wood rose as their symbol and donate money to the cause. This could be a bad sign, but I could find absolutely no evidence for a Friends of Dactylanthus group. If they ever really existed beyond a concept, they disbanded years ago. Another interesting suggestion they put forth is an investigation into microclimates for plants in cages. Doc volunteers have put a large number of Dactylanthus in cages to protect them from possums. As this also protects them from pollinators, those caged plants need to undergo hand pollination, which, while proving to be very effective, is also a huge drain on resources. But consider the flexibility of microclimate research. This is a technique that, if successful, could be transferable to many vulnerable plants, and yet there's just not enough information about it. Doc's action plan is comprehensive and admirable. Reading it, I'd expect to be able to find data on the improvement of Dactylanthus populations, but unfortunately, it seems like that was it. The 10 years elapsed in 2014, four years ago, and there is no new action plan on the Doc website or anywhere else. One study on genetic variation was done by a thesis student, but new studies have been hard to find. But one step up from the woodrows in the food chain is the short-tailed bat, for which there is a lot more interest and up-to-date information. Doc is currently working on an ambitious conservation project to translocate and hand-rear short-tailed bats from Tararua Forest, while also reducing rat and stoat numbers by more than 80% in that area. No matter our gut reaction to seeing injured or pained animals, we should remember that a diseased or vulnerable plant population can have just as much of an effect on the ecosystem. If we want to save our fluffy friends, we must also work to protect their silent, unappreciated neighbours. On the whole, I consider this a PR problem. The wood rose just needs to be sexed up. But while I'm more than willing to deliver Doc a diatribe on the sexiness of parasitic forest flowers, in the meantime there are a few things we can do ourselves. Wood roses are very pretty, but they belong in the ground, not on our windowsills. Don't pick them up, and if you can, try to stop other people from picking them up. If you have dogs, don't let them snuffle around and harm the flowers. And for that matter, if you have pigs, make sure they don't roam around in an area with Dactylanthus plants, as they are known for dislodging them. Doc have a hard job, and nobody would disagree with that, but now is the time to be doing it. It'd be a damn shame if the New Zealand wood rose died out while we were too busy looking the other way at better looking species.